this, uh, this morning, uh, for morning puja, we recited uh, in English the, um, the fire sermon. <coughs> um, and it was a, uh, an occasion where uh, a thousand uh, ascetics, wandering ascetics, uh, had uh, gathered uh, around the Buddha uh, for a, a teaching. Uh, they weren't um, disciples of the Buddha right at the time, but um, were a group of uh, fire worshippers, uh, many different kinds of uh, samanas, seekers, spiritual seekers at, at the time of the Buddha from uh, all, many different kinds of ascetic traditions, and these were fire worshippers. Um, obviously with uh, a number of other kinds of um, uh, practices, I guess, other than just fire worship that uh, made it such that they were open to what the Buddha had to offer uh, and were genuine, genuine seekers uh, and had likely developed a, a strong uh, capacity uh, uh, of spiritual faculties, uh, had many spiritual faculties already developed uh, other than just a kind of a fire-worshipping practice. So they were very open to uh, his teaching. And um, the Buddha essentially uh, taught this discourse, the fire sermon, using the analogy of fire uh, because that was what these uh, thousand ascetics were uh, used to uh, as imagery. Um, but he kind of turned it around and, and um, used uh, the, the image of fire as a kind of a metaphor for uh, the burning uh, that we experience uh, with uh, greed, hatred, and delusion uh, as the basis for that, for that, that burning. Um, so that all the sense bases are burning with the fires of passion, aversion, and delusion, greed, hatred, and delusion. Anyway, it was just a, it's a very powerful image, and it, and it was also fairly early in the, in the Buddha's dispensation that he taught this. And, and the uh, consequence of it was, is that actually all, th- all thousand of these uh, wandering ascetics uh, with this discourse uh, attained arahantship. So it's quite remarkable. And I wasn't planning to necessarily kind of talk about the, that particular theme, but I was just um, appreciating the, the set and the setting of it, the, um, the, the incredible variety of uh, humanity, um, people that uh, found their way to the Buddha and that the Buddha welcomed uh, into his uh, teaching, into his retinue in a sense, um, all the way from these kinds of various different kinds of samanas or seekers with their various traditions um, or the you know, various uh, um, People from other walks of life, maybe coming from you know, wealthy patrons, um, uh, Anatta Pindaka, Visaka, um, lay, uh, wealthy lay patrons, or uh, all the way, all castes were uh, represented in terms of people who were attracted to his teaching, you know, all the way from the lowest uh, untouchables uh, up to the, the Brahmin caste. Um, and everything in between, um, just the uh, incredible diversity of, of uh, people in various uh, walks of life who uh, found their way to the Buddhist teaching. And just kind of reflecting on um, the human human beings, you know, uh, that um, that we, you know, it's a very unique uh, 
kind of rebirth that we've, we've found ourselves in as human beings. It's a very special one, or it can be a very special one, if we uh, take the opportunity. Uh, and that's demonstrated, it doesn't matter what class or status or gender or ethnicity or any, you know, any of these kinds of surface qualities that um, uh, cause us to appear in certain ways or uh, you know, act in society in certain ways, but just the commonality of being a human being that uh, creates an opportunity, a very special opportunity for us. And I think it's just really important to, to reflect on that. Um, uh, sometimes we take this human life you know, for granted, in a sense, um, and don't really reflect or realize um, how rare uh, and uh, important it is in terms of, of developing uh, our spiritual path. Because we, you know, human beings have this capacity to um, to do very, very uh, uh, unwholesome kinds of things, you know. Um, you know, the amount of uh, destruction that we can cause uh, to ourselves and to others, uh, the amount of suffering that we can bring into, into existence um, through our confused, deluded minds and all the traits that go along with that. Uh, uh, you know, the amount of harm and cruelty, actually, that can be part of being a human being. And the opposite qualities of, uh, you know, in the capacity uh, to experience and, and act on uh, very, very profoundly uh, wonderful, the highest kinds of mind states that are achievable, really, in, in the realms of, uh, of consciousness, you know, Kindness and compassion uh, are these very, very lofty uh, states of mind. You know, uh, incredible wisdom uh, is within the human capacity. So, it's a it's a level of consciousness, a level of, of birth that um, uh, can run all the way from the almost the lowest of the low to the highest of the high, uh, and uh, thereby presents a very unique opportunity um, to, to uh, aspire to and uh, realize uh, something that's, that's very transcendent beyond our normal conscious experience. You know, when you think about it even just more in our Kind of most of us are probably somewhere in, in the middle between being, you know, on the very negative, cruel end of, of, of life and the, and the super developed and dwelling in complete compassion and kindness. And so most of us are kind of somewhere in between that. And, but even within the realm, even the experience of our own, own lives, um, you know, the capacity to... Uh, even in one, one day, even in one hour, you know, to, to see the cycles of, say, you know, on the downside, the negativity or cynicism or dark kinds of mind states, uh, distrust, you know, all these kinds of um, not very pleasant uh, mind states that we can experience. And, and then um, the levels of... of uh, Ease and well-being and uh, well-wishing and compassion and trust and um, you know very positive, optimistic uh, kinds of mind states. So the, you know, the human being is you know we we can be all over the map, <laughs> um, you know, and have just you know these enormous capacities for um, for uh, goodness. Uh, that we need to start, if we haven't already, but that we need to fully develop. Uh, so just thinking about you know, the uh, uniqueness of, of being a human being and the opportunities available to us and 
to, how to really determine to make the most of it. In the tra Tibetan tradition, they have a very explicit teaching called uh, about precious human life. And uh, of course, all of these things are found in the <laughs> Pali Canon as well, um, in, in different places, in different ways. But um, just reflecting that um, as a human being, um, um, if the certain circumstances are present, then uh, we can take advantage of, uh, uh, of our situation. And, and some of those qualities externally that uh, are very uh, conducive uh, to the practice and that, that kind of give us the opportunity to be more than just uh, you know, part of the species of human being, but, but actually to really become a fully developed uh, human being. Uh, in a sense, not just a, um, uh, not just Pugala, but more like Manusa, I think, is the more developed uh, aspect of being a human being, if I've got those right. Um, but we have, you know, all the requisites that we need. You know, there are many people in the world that don't have uh, proper food or, or proper shelter, um, uh, are the medicines uh, for when uh, we inevitably get sick. Um, and um, we can reflect that probably everybody who's listening to uh, this talk uh, has adequate uh, food. Um, certainly here at the monastery, we have way more than adequate food. We're very uh, blessed with the, uh, the generous offerings that that sustain our body, and sometimes actually we can get a bit overly charged about uh, what it is that we feel like we need to have, and very refined, can get pretty super refined about what it is that we think we need, and, and even then we still have pretty much that choice here, you know, there's the, the wide variety, so uh, we're very blessed uh, to have food, you know, that uh, can sustain us and, and keep our faculties uh, functioning well, keep our body uh, in mind functioning well. So we've, we've got these requisites. We've got uh, good accommodations to, to protect us um, from the weather. Uh, and we've got um, uh, clothing to keep us covered and warm. Uh, and we've got medicines uh, uh, for when we need them and, and actually a fairly well-developed uh, access to, to health care for most of us anyway, but there's actually a lot of people that don't have that these days, but uh, I think most of us here feel have pretty fortunate access to that. So, so we've got requisites um, as part of uh, our supports, and, and we need those uh, for practicing Dhamma. Um, you know, if you're, if you're starving or uh, you know, thirsty or uh, exposed or you don't have shelter, uh, your mind becomes very focused on, on just being able to have those, those uh, basic requisites and it, it doesn't have enough space, spaciousness to, to be open to Dhamma practice. So we've got requisites and we should be uh, aware of that and take advantage of that. We've got, um, We've got intact, most of us, I think, probably have at least good enough intact sense faculties. We can uh, see and hear, and, or even if some of those are impaired, usually we've got one or the other, uh, at least to the extent enough to, to be able to access um, the teachings. Um, uh, we've got enough of an intact intellect uh, in the mind, as well as the other sense bases, but um, thinking about the... Uh, the capacity to um, understand um, uh, teachings, to, to uh, have a uh, ability. We have these ability, uh, this ability for language, communication, um, and understanding uh, each other. So um, this is not always the case, uh, even in the human realm. You know, there are people whose sense faculties are so impaired that uh, they don't have that kind of access or that ability to communicate and understand. So um, it's another 
thing to reflect on how fortunate we are and how um, that isn't uh, that isn't the case. It's not a, it's not the case, you know, um, that everybody has all of those intact. We have access to teachings. There's a dispensation that, at least the Buddha of this this age, uh, Gotama Buddha, 2,500 years ago, more than that, established, and is still uh, existing today. Um, so there's teachings in the world uh, that we can tap into and, and are uh, tapping into. So it's part of being a human being is that we've got these um, requisites, we've got these faculties, we've got teachings available. This is very fortunate. Internally, too, you know, we've got um, certain unique faculties that um, uh, we can take advantage of. You know, say in the animal realm, uh, fac- some of the, particularly more of the internal, like the intellectual faculties, are quite limited. Um, we've got animal brains, too, just like the animals do, but we've got this heap of cortex matter <laughs> on top of the animal brain that... Uh, uh, is so well developed that it gives us this capacity uh, beyond, say, the animal realm. Uh, we have a capacity to reflect, um, to use the intellect, use the mind to um, uh, be able to, to yeah, this capacity for reflection, to be able to consider, to, to step away from just being so completely absorbed in, in uh, getting our basic needs met. Um, we have the capacity to step back and, and look uh, with awareness. We have capacity to, um, to, to understand uh, more refined aspects of our experience and, and all the various mental activities that uh, come into play um, in our experience. So this unique capacity to, uh, for, for reflection. We have um, uh, lots of other faculties too. I think of, of uh, a real important one of like moral conscience uh, in, in, in the Pali Hiri Otapa, which is like conscience and concern is uh, one of the better translations, I think, although maybe not quite so accurate, but conscience and concern. Uh, for you know, the moral quality of our life, and um, you know, we can reflect on on quality. You know, with this ability that we have to reflect, we can look and see um, that suffering, um, you know, has a root in in uh, harmfulness, and that when we harm ourselves or when we harm other people, um, we can. There's a sense of, of, of concern that can pop into our minds if we, you know, if we if we, if we look at it, uh, if we choose to to bring that quality up in our minds, um, we can see how unskillful actions uh, make us feel. Uh, we can feel the pain not only when other people uh, engage in unskillful uh, actions in body or mind or speech. Uh, towards us, we, we know how it feels, and then we have the ability to uh, see how we can do that too, and how sometimes we, through our uh, speech and our action, uh, can hurt other people. So this, con- you know, this kind of moral conscience is a real, uh, they call it the, uh, uh, the guardian, uh, the, world, the, guardian of the, the guardians of the world, Hiryanotapa, Lokapala. Um, they're an innate uh, capacity or faculty that we have as, as human beings uh, to have this kind of sense of, of conscience and concern. We also have a, a faculty that you know, really helps us, I think, in development of spiritual practice, the, the fact that we have a uh, capacity for, for, for faith so that yeah, we can we can reflect. Um, you know, I'm not there now. I you know I I'm just beginning maybe to to understand uh, 
how uh, I create suffering uh, in my life, uh, and and you know through um, exploring the teachings and hanging around uh, good people, uh, people that have put the teachings into practice and have realized the benefits from it. Um, even though I'm not there, I can look and see, well, there's other people around that, um, you know, have, have developed what, I, what it is that I'd like to develop. You know, people who seem to be much more uh, at ease in the world and, and contented and, and at peace. Uh, and um, luckily, some of those people are, are out there, and, you know, like our, our spiritual leaders, our teachers, um, going all the way, of course, back to the Buddha. Uh, and so we can look at that and say, well, I'm not there, I don't really understand it completely, but I have a, a glimpse or an inkling that maybe there is something um, that will help me, uh, that will help me uh, see that there is a way uh, out of this, this suffering. We have this uh, wish uh, as human beings for, uh, we have this capacity to see the suffering, we have the uh, capacity to uh, be free from it. And, and we're not there, but we have the faith, uh, the confidence um, that uh, if we if we take it to heart and use our innate capacities and our faculties, we can, we can develop that path and um, really uh, realize uh, a, a true end to the predicament that we're in. We have that unique capacity as human beings to do that. We have a capacity... Um, human beings to develop discernment, uh, the discernment, the wisdom um, that can uh, lead us uh, not only into understanding uh, the goal uh, and the practice and where it can take us, but also uh, how to do it. Um, So we have this discernment that can direct us to where we to where we put our attention to use wise attention. One of our main tools uh, as human beings that we have is we have this capacity to um, direct our attention uh, in wise ways uh, based on uh, the path, based on the uh, the noble eightfold path. So we can look and and see what um, patterns. Uh, are in our in our minds uh, that lead us to repetitively engaging in activities that, that won't bring us very much happiness, or not at least in the long term. Uh, we can see how those uh, patterns play out, um, and we can uh, make a resolution. We can establish an intention. We have enough awareness of. Uh, how to manipulate the the mental processes so that we can establish an intention um, for uh, more wholesome qualities, developing them and abandoning the unwholesome ones. We can, and then based on that capacity to establish an intention, we can shift our attention to uh, skillful means, um, shift our attention away from uh, actions of body, speech, and mind that bring us uh, unskillful, unhappy uh, results and, and shift it to mental states and capacities and reflections that uh, steer us into uh, goodness and wisdom. So we have that faculty of, of uh, wisdom uh, that we can develop uh, as human beings using this reflective capacity using the reflective capacity and the, the faith uh, that it can be done. Uh, so this is what you know, it can be like to be a human being uh, and realizing that this 
birth in this particular plane of existence is, is actually, uh, of all the possibilities, is considered to be the most uh, efficacious one. It, beings in lower realms uh, are either filled with so much uh, difficulty and suffering or um, delusion like the animal realm, you know, is pretty much one that's based on uh, getting enough food or uh, reproduction or uh, fear, you know, getting away from harm. And that's pretty much the uh, experience of the animal realm. And so that, you know, there, there isn't that kind of capacity to, to develop spiritually very easily. Uh, and even lower realms uh, with uh, the intensity of the, of the suffering, or the higher realms, like the, the Deva realms, um, where there are you know, stronger, uh, much stronger uh, capacities, uh, mental capacities, but life is so wonderful, in the, particularly in the higher sensual realms, um, that there's just no motivation um, to to uh, seek a way out of it because it's so nice. You know, who'd want to leave this? Who'd want to who'd leave the Tawatinksa heaven with all of its delights? Um, or even the very, very high, refined uh, other worlds, Brahma worlds and above, of, you know, based on high meditative attainments um, and high levels of consciousness, very pristine and pure, uh, and some based, you know, in very lofty, uh, conditions of, you know, kindness and compassion and equanimity um, and the vast lengths of time that can be spent in realms just with those as your primary experience. But without, without the capacity, um, or they have, there is the capacity, but without the, the development of discernment and wisdom to be able to see beyond that, uh, that particular kind of conscious experience. Human realm um, is kind of a ideal balance of uh, having enough to be relatively comfortable, to have our faculties intact, to have teachings available and to be able to understand them, um, and enough comfort to, so that there isn't you know, super intense suffering like in other realms, but also enough pain and suffering and difficulty, both mental and physical, that, it, that there's a motivation, there's a reason we can reflect and uh, establish some uh, motivation and desire um, to, uh, to, to see an alternative, uh, to develop an alternative. So that's part of the wonder of, of being in this human, human body and human mind capacities. It's also kind of, you know, something else that's, I think, you know, very unique for us to consider on a kind of a grander cosmological level is, is this dispensation that we find ourselves in with uh, the Buddha's teachings. And this, uh, the Buddha refers to this eon uh, uh, as a very fortunate eon. Um, you know, an eon is a pretty incomprehensible period of time. Lots of similes that uh, describe uh, what an eon actually means. Um, but essentially, an incomprehen- at least to our, our kind of meager human minds, an, an incomprehensible uh, length of time uh, of world expansion and contraction. Uh, and then in this fortunate eon, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's b- already been five Buddhas uh, that have appeared uh, to keep the dispensation uh, teachings alive and one more to come, apparently. So six Buddhas in an eon is considered to be pretty fortunate. There are some eons that have no Buddhas uh, and some that just have one, two, or three. But this is a fortunate one. And, and then the Buddha of this particular uh, dispensation, Gotama Buddha, uh, was also a very unique one within a unique uh, eon in that um, 
some Buddhas, you know, all, most of them will have some sort of dispensation teachings of some sort, uh, but uh, some of them um, are, are a bit more limited, you know, say the ones that don't fully develop a, a training, uh, a Vinaya training from the monastic community, or maybe don't fully develop the teachings uh, in some way, um, so that the, the, their dispensations don't last quite as long. But this particular Buddha, Gautama Buddha, had a very uh, strong capacity for wisdom. Uh, all, the, all the Buddhas sort of have their kind of uh, specialty training, <laughs> if you will, and, and this Buddha was uh, uh, the faculty of wisdom. Um, and others, you know, like the one to come, it's, that it's said in the, in the teachings that the one to come will have a very strong faculty of, of metta, loving kindness. Metteya Buddha is the the one to come next. Um, this Buddha, as I said, though, has uh, wisdom as uh, a leading faculty and was able to establish the teachings and proclaim the teachings uh, in a way that was able to reach many, many different people of, of different abilities and capabilities and capacities uh, because of his great wisdom and his ability to express the teachings in, in the way that he did. And he also established a very strong training, discipline training, uh, for you know, especially the monastic community, but also a, a lay training um, of, of equal uh, strength. So uh, as a result, the teachings have lasted so far for 2,500 years. They seem to be you know, intact enough. Um, there are some people who say that this is already the Dhamma ending age, that Things have started to deteriorate. The teachings have become corrupt, but I think that they're still in pretty good shape, from best I can tell. You know, at least in small circles, there you do see signs of change and misinterpretation, and even people attributing certain teachings to the Buddha that really weren't. Uh, at least from our understanding of the Pali Canon, uh, the original teachings, anyway. But uh, but I I have a real strong good feeling that, you know, this is a, the teachings are still here, you know, and that there are beings that are, are realizing the, the fruits of the teaching to the fullest extent. Um, so I feel quite heartened by that. Um, so, you know, um, this Buddha, this age that we're in, uh, this, this particular dispensation, this particular eon, um, this particular place and time, the requisites that we have, uh, it's all here. Um, we've got the capacities to, to explore and to understand and to practice and to share with others. And, um, you know, when you think about this in the vast, vast expanse of, of time and space and, and uh, samsara, the wandering on, um, that all of this, all of those things have come together right here, right now. And there's a few of us who are uh, interested. Uh, as the uh, Rahul was chanting the invitation to, to give a desana, it's like there, there are beings with just a little dust in their eyes, in our eyes. Um, and um, we should... Uh, listen and practice, listen with eager ears uh, to the teachings that are available now. We should uh, put as much energy and capacity and time as, as we can. This is, this is, um, this is our uh, way to freedom. And we've got everything we need right here, right now, in this tiny point in time and space uh, to, do, uh, to do what needs to be done. So the, uh, as the saying goes, uh, the, uh, Ajahn Sumedho's, one of Ajahn Sumedho's fra favorite phrases, the doors to the deathless are open. And it's our, um, it's our uh, capacity and, and really our duty to, to, uh, to pick up the teachings and walk through the doors of the deathless, to the deathless. 
So uh, I think I'll leave it there for this evening, and um, we can um, close uh, close for the evening, for the evening, for the evening, for the evening, for the evening.